Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely come find us like blazing. Good morning, Pastor Rich here. Just wanted to tell you thank you for joining us online in our virtual experience here at Spout Springs Church. Uh, we want to continue on with worship here in just a little bit, but just wanted to tell you thank you for joining, uh, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook or in our living room app. Uh, feel free to also say something in the comment section. Let us know how you're doing. And of course, we'll love to hear about ways we can pray for you. So let's continue on with worship. You've been walking the same old road for miles and miles. If you've been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies. If you're trying to fill the 
the same old holes inside There's a better life There's a better life If you've got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom This is Pastor Barry, and thank you for joining us today online at Spout Springs Church. One of the things that we are very excited to be sharing with you is our 21 days of prayer. This is something that we do every year, and it is a way to help you grow in your relationship with the Lord. We know that there are many questions that people have about prayer and how to go about that, and we're hoping that what we're offering you is something that will help you with that. There's going to be a manual. There's going to be Facebook Live videos where you can tune in and ask for prayer. But more than anything, we're hoping that the next 21 days will be something that will not only be instructional to you, but also an encouragement. So please take advantage of it. Please use it. And we're looking forward to hearing how it has helped you over the next few weeks. We also set aside a time each week where we can simply give back to God as he has asked us to do. And the easiest way to do that is to simply download our Spout Springs Church app. You can open that up, go to the bottom, hit the giving tab, and you can set something up there. But before we move on, I'd like to go ahead and take a moment and just say a prayer with you. Father, I just thank you so much that uh, prayer is a gift from you, and it is something that we can use to simply build our relationship with you. And I pray, Father, that we would take full advantage of that. Father, I also pray for our church as we strive to reach out into the community, as we strive to build lives and encourage others, and simply share with them the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that everything given here today would be out of worship to you and would be used to further your kingdom. Amen. Well, folks, thank you so much. And in just a moment, we're going to continue with worship.
Well, hello, how's it going? Uh, hopefully, this will be our last online only week for a, for a good, hopefully till the next snow day. That's what we're kind of shooting for, is hopefully we'll be able to do both safely live on campus and continue to do online for the foreseeable future. So hopefully that'll work out. A uh, reminder quickly before I get into anything else, if you have children, don't forget our children's ministry stuff that we can show you the links for now and really get in with your kids and help them grow spiritually, become the people God wants them to be as you're growing into the person God wants you to be as well. Um, also, do not forget, and this is exciting too, our 21 days of prayer start tomorrow. If you haven't picked up your, if you want the paper copy, head over to the New Growth Cafe here on the church campus. And you can get that on the porch or if they're live, go in and buy some coffee and get, get something there too. Um, or if you want to, you can download it and get the PDF and you can use a fillable PDF for that. But you really want to get in that with us. We've got the videos every day. It's going to be a great time of us sort of coming together as the, the family of Christ, but also learning to pray. It's a lot of this is training us how to pray better. So if you say, I'm not sure if I can do that. That's the point is for a lot of us to help us learn how to pray. And if you've, I don't know anybody who thinks they're a great prayer. So we're going to be learning and growing together and praying together. And it, it's going to be a wonderful, it was a wonderful time last year. It's going to be great this year. So make sure you get get the, the, the prayer guide and come through, work through that with us. We're also starting a brand new series today on words. Now, not just the, the word, the Bible says that Jesus is the word of God, but words are important in Christianity. Words are important in our faith. And it's very important that we understand certain words just have so much power. And the problem is some of those words have incredible power and we don't even know what they mean or, or we just use them like like the word glory today's word is the word glory and we throw that word around a lot but I'm not sure we even define it very well I know my, my grandma amazing Christian woman prayed me into being a Christian wonderful she just like say well glory and she probably knew what it meant but to me it was just well you know it was just yay and a lot of times we have that the word glory, and glory is a very important word. Let me show you how important the word glory is in the Bible and to the people in the Bible. In the Hebrew Bible, one of the big stories, as, as you probably are aware, is the Exodus. And the Israelites are slaves in Egypt, and God sends Moses. Moses leads them out. They go to a mountain called Mount Sinai, and on Mount Sinai, God gives them the covenant. And the covenant includes all the prescriptions, it includes the Ten Commandments, all these things. And the idea is God is setting up a nation so he can do the work of bringing about redemption and restoration into his creation. And he, he's going to use this single nation to be the agent of that. But he's had this nation on the mountain for a while now, and he's pretty much done with them. <laughs> he, he refers to them as being stiff-necked, meaning he's over there going, over here, look at me, and they go, and they, they won't turn their neck to him. They keep their neck where they want to go, and they're not paying attention to God. And God says, you know what? You know what, Moses? Moses, Moses is our leader. He's got Moses up on the mountain. He says, Moses, you know what? what? We're done. We're done. I, I just can't. I, I just can't even with these people. If, if, if I go with you, any, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you to the promised land and you can set up the kingdom and I'm going to send some angels to kind of work with you. Angels are intermediaries. I'm going to send angels, but I am not going. I am not going with you people because if I do, I swear, we're, we're making God a little too human. This is how, how it's kind of presented. Uh, I swear if I go with you, I will just dig a hole to the center of the earth and dump those people in it. They are so stiff neck. They annoy me so much. I'm going to zap them eventually. So for their own safety, I am going to leave them alone and let them go up by themselves. And here's what Moses says back to God when God says that. Moses said in Exodus chapter 33, verse 15, Then Moses said to him, If your presence do not, does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people in the face of the earth? And the Lord says to Moses, I will do the very thing you've asked because I am pleased with you. And I know you by name. Moses, you're good enough that I will go up because you're asking. And Moses, though, says, you know what? I want something more. 
I want more than you saying this. I want something else. And verse 18, Moses said, now show me your glory. Glory. There's that word we just said. We don't even know what it means. To Moses, it's such an important word. Moses could have asked God for anything. Now, Moses had seen a lot. Moses had seen Red Seas parted. He'd seen all the, all the miracles. He'd seen all kinds of stuff. So, But he wanted, he's going, God, here's what he's saying. God, I have seen glimpses of you and your glory. I want to see the real thing. I want to see clearly you. I want to see your glory. And God actually shows Moses his glory. Moses, God hides Moses in a rock and he gives Moses a glimpse of as much intensity of God's glory as he can take at a glance. And then he starts meeting with Moses in a tent, the tent of meeting they call it, of course. And Moses is able to see God's glory on a lesser intensity thing. So he's asking, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, yes. And we're going, what did he see? What exactly is God's glory? Let me give you a, a simple, quick definition that we'll have to explain. The simple, quick definition is this. God's glory is his holiness revealed. God's glory is his holiness revealed. And you're saying, Steve, that's one of those where you answered the question but just gave me more questions because, okay, while I don't understand what glory is, I'm not really sure I understand what holiness is either. I mean, th th that's, that's another one of those what are you talking about words. Okay, let's define holiness because if God's glory is his holiness revealed, we need to understand what holiness is. Well, God's holiness is how he is distinct from us. God is other. Okay, now, now, my tendency is to think God as holy as God being apart, or I think of other people being holy as people who act pious. No, it means distinct. Now, let me, let me explain it to you this way. My very first car was an AMC Concord. Now, you may or may not have ever seen an AMC Concord, and if you saw it, it is very possible that you forgot about it immediately. They were not the most amazing vehicles ever created, okay? So there, there's a picture of my, my that's not mine, but that is a 1980-ish AMC Concorde. Mine was a darker blue than that, okay? Now, let me show you another car. This is a Bugatti. Now, when I bought my AMC Concorde in 1985, my first car, okay? I paid $2,000, actually I borrowed $2,000 and paid it back to the bank to get my car, okay? It cost $2,000. That Bugatti starts at around $2 million. And if you look at the two side by side, there's a distinction there. They are different. They're, 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 they're similarities, but they are different. Now they're not separated by distance as much as they are by quality. Okay, And God's holiness is how he is distinct from us and from his creation, not by distance, but by quality. He is different. He is other. Give, give you a picture of this. Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And you may have experienced that very event. You may have been somewhere where the heavens declared, the creation in general, declared the glory of God to you. You may have, maybe somebody who likes to sit on top of a mountain and look out over the, over the valleys and go, wow. And, and you get a, get a sense of God and you see God's glory. Or you go to the beach and you see something magnificent in the, on, on the way the waves are, flow, are coming in and out. And you say, wow, that's, kind of, that's God's glory. Now here's what you never say when you're experiencing the glory of God in one of those situations. Look at the night sky going, wow, that is amazing. The heavens are declared. What you never say is, I'm looking at that and going, that's God's glory. Man, me and God are so much alike. Right? You're never doing that. You're never saying, wow, God and I are like, we're like this. We're about the same. No, when you see the glory of God, you recognize how different, how distinct God is from you. Okay, so matter of fact, that glory is intense. The word glory means heavy. The root word means heavy. It's an intensity to it. Matter of fact, one of the things that comes out of the God having so much glory is we see throughout, especially the Hebrew Bible, the concept of the fear of the Lord. And that's not because God is scary. It's because God is so different. 
Things that are really, really different are scary, and things that are big and different are scary. You know, um, every one of the Jurassic Park movies, what are, are they up to what, 27, Jurassic Park 27, whatever number they're up to right now, in every one of the Jurassic Park movies, there's one where they really emphasize how different, how distinct dinosaurs are from people, and they'll do it by having a stampede and putting people in the middle of a dinosaur stampede. And the dinosaurs aren't wanting to hurt the people. This is not like the, when the T-Rex or one of those guys is trying to eat people. This is when just the big old leaf eaters, right? And they're just cucumbering along. But the people are so different that they're going, ah, 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 I'm going to die. Fear. They're afraid because the dinosaurs are different. And the fear of the Lord is not a fear because God's mean, that God's going to get mad and he's going to zap us. It's a fear because God is so distinct and so other and so big and so magnificent. And as we see that distinction, as we see that holiness, we understand something of his glory. His glory is revealed as we see the holiness, the distinctness, the otherness of God. So when Moses says to God, show me your glory, he's saying, show me how you are totally unlike me totally better than me and these stiff-necked people I'm trying to lead. And God did show his glory. Like I said, God hid Moses in a crevice of a rock, and he went by so God could get a glimpse of him at high intensity, and then he set up the tent of meeting where, where Moses could meet with God at a lower intensity, like a light turned down a little bit. You know, like had a, you know the glory has a dimmer switch to where it, it, it's an intensity that Moses could handle. But that glory changed Moses. Just being in the lower intensity in the tent changed more. So listen, this is Exodus 34, the next very next chapter, and we're just like the, we're continuing the same story. It says when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hand, when he's got the Ten Commandments. Remember, he broke the first set, literally threw, the, threw them down. Only person ever to break all Ten Commandments at once. You're welcome. He, he threw them down, broke them. He had to carve a new set of, rock, set of stone tablets, go back up, get new ones. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant in his law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. Fear of the Lord. He's now different. He's carrying some of the glory of God with him, and it's intense enough that it scared the people. The fear of the Lord came on them for Moses because Moses had been transformed by the glory of God. Okay? When Moses finished speaking to them, he put, he put a veil over his face. Okay? But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil. Okay? So when Moses wants to speak to the people, he veils his face so it's not as scary. Okay? So it's not as intense and intimidating. But when he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went to speak to the Lord again. So every time Moses goes to speak with God and he comes out, his face glows. Now over time, of course, he gets farther away from God and we'll know that. We find out that the glow fades over time. But the glory of God changes Moses. But it's so amazing. Ephesians 1.21, Paul says about the glory of God. Now he, God, is far above any ruler, authority, or power, or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God is other. He is distinct. He is incredibly holy. And as we see that holiness and it is revealed, that revelation of God's holiness is the glory of God. It is to the glory of God for his holiness to be revealed. Now, what does that mean for us? How does that impact how we live our lives or how should it impact how we live our lives? Well, let me give you okay, three points because I'm a pastor and we like the number three. So the first one, God's glory makes obedience understandable. God's glory makes obedience understandable. We have this tendency to want to pick and choose what we want to do from God's standards. Oh, God says this, but I'm not going to do that one. I want if God's glorious, if God's magnificent, if God is totally other, if God is totally holy, if God is totally spectacular, then I'm not going to be picking and choosing what he tells me. Which should I obey? Okay, Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9, famous verses. God says, My thoughts are not like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, those heavens that declare the glory of God, just as they are higher than the earth, so are my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Now let me show you just how much this works. Because glory is revealing God's holiness, right? Do you know what sin is? 
Well, sin is when we do things that violate God's standards, right? When God, we live away from God's principles. Well, what's actually happening? Well, Romans 3.23 defines sin this way. All of us have sinned, and you, you guys, some of you guys know this. You Bible geeks, you know this one. All have sinned and fallen short of the what? Of the glory of God. As we live God's standards, we're revealing God's holiness. We are bringing glory to God. And as we understand the glory of God, we are more likely to want to live into his standards. And so therefore, we don't want to fall short of the glory of God. We want to live into the glory of God. Does that make sense in that kind of goal? Okay. Matter of fact, Paul tells us in one of his letters, the letter to the Corinthians, that our job is to be living in such a way that we are declaring God's holiness, bringing him glory in everything that we do. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do it all so that you are proclaiming the glory of God. You are revealing God's holiness to the people around you. Whatever you're doing, live in such a way that you are declaring God's glorious, that God is glorious, declaring his glory. In my obedience, what I'm trying to do when I obey God, I'm not obeying God so God doesn't get mad at me. I don't want to fall short of his glory. In my obedience, I'm attempting to reveal to others the distinctiveness and superiority of God and his ways. My job as I'm living out his standards is not to make keep God from being angry. God's in the forgiveness business. My job, one of the big reasons I want to live into his standards and do all the things that he wants me to do that I don't want to fall short of his glory is I want to declare that glory to others. I want to show them his holiness, his distinctiveness, his superiority. And so when I get to that point, when I'm grasping his glory, I'm going to let God be God. I'm going to listen and I'm going to obey. I'm not going to go, well, that one, I don't like that one. I don't like that. You know, we talked about do Christians and don't Christians. Do Christians are the ones who like when God says do something. Don't Christians are, are the ones who are better off when God says don't do something. Like God says don't commit adultery and don't steal the don't Christian one. Yeah, got that one down. And when God says do love your neighbor as yourself and do care for the poor and do care for those who are weak, use your power to help those who, are, who don't have power, that's for the do Christians. And the, the, the don't Christian, I don't like those. But if I'm living for the glory of God, when God says don't, well, I don't. And when God says do, I don't come up with a reason why I shouldn't. I don't, as we like to say, I don't explain it away and say why that one doesn't apply to me. I do it. Whether God says don't do that, okay, don't do that. Or God says do that, well, then I'm going to do that because it's about the glory of God, revealing God's holiness to others for God's glory, okay? Now, so not only, it helps us with our obedience. There's another area, now this is a heavy one. You're, you're gonna have trouble with this one. I have trouble with this one. This one, I have trouble getting my brain to stay wrapped around this one. But God's glory makes suffering survivable. God's glory makes suffering survivable. Now, here's a story that you're going to have trouble with. I have trouble with this story. This story messes me up. Whenever I stop and think about it and read it honestly, this story messes me up. But let's, let's look at it anyway. It's in John chapter 9. And the Gospel of John, John's retelling of a lot of the events of, of Jesus' life. And Jesus comes across, he's walking with his disciples and they pass a man who was born blind. He, was, he, he, he didn't do something or he didn't have an accident, didn't have a disease. He was genetically blind. He, couldn't, he was blind from birth. And his, his followers said to him, hey, Jesus, um, theological question. That dude over there who was born blind, is he blind because he committed some sort of sin like in heaven or he was going to commit a sin? Or, he sinned, or, he, or is he blind because his parents committed a sin? Is it somebody else did something bad or he did something bad? And Jesus blows their brains away. And this will blow your brain away too if you're not careful. It does mine frequently. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents. Neither one of them sinned. This guy's not blind because he sinned because they sinned. But listen to this. But that the works of God might be displayed in him. That the works of God might be displayed in him. Now ask your question. When God's works are displayed, what's that called? The glory of God. Right? Holiness, God's distinctness, God's otherness, God's superior to God's amazingness, revealed is glory. So he didn't sin, his parents didn't sin, but he was born blind and has spent his entire life up to this moment blind so God can be glorified. That 
that goes so much against me because here's what's going on in let me tell you what's happening in steve's brain steve doesn't value the glory of god enough so when he says so that god can be glorified i'm thinking god must be mean because i don't value his glory so much that i think it's worth having problems I don't value God's glory so much, but Moses, when he said, when he had an opportunity to ask, God, show me anything. God, show me your glory. Okay? So the glory is so important. But remember part of the glory. You got got to stop for a second because if you're not careful, right now you're thinking of the glory of God and you're thinking of the magnificence. You're not thinking of the whole thing about God's holiness because it's God's superiority, God's superlatives. How amazing God is. Well, what's one of the most amazing things about God? is love. See, I love some. God is love. 1 John 4, 16 says, So we have come to know and to believe the love of God, that love that God has for us. God is love. <laughs> God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So God is love. So when we're revealing his holiness, one of the things that's being revealed is what? His love. How much, uh, how much of the time is God revealing his love? All the time. If he is love and he is revealing himself, then he has to be revealing himself with every act he takes. God cannot do an act that isn't loving because he is love. And as he reveals himself, his holiness, his holiness includes his love, and as he reveals that, his glory, his glory reveals his love. So this man, God's glory was, is so amazing and so powerful and his love is so spectacular. It was, are you ready? Worth it. It was a good trade for him to spend his majority of his life blind because God was going to get glory and that glory included love. And here, put it this way. Whatever God allows to happen to us is an act of his love. Whatever God allows, now we're talking about suffering here, right? Whatever God allows to happen to Steve is an act of, of God's love. Whatever God's, God allows to happen to you, put your name in there, is an act of his love. Whether we can comprehend it or not. We have this tendency to want to say, well, this happened, this bad thing happened so that this other thing could happen. No! The, the thing God allowed in your life because it would bring glory to him and he would manifest his glory, his holiness, and his love. Okay? Charles Spurgeon, I use this quote a lot because Spurgeon just nails it. Remember this. Had any other condition been better for you than the one in which you are, divine love would have put you there. If there was a better place, if there were better circumstances where God could manifest and reveal his love to you in a greater way than the way place you are right now, that's where you'd be. Because he's all love. God is 100% love. And as he reveals himself, glory, it's all love. And if there were a better place, you'd be there. You are currently, you're not, some of you got to, some of you are going to freak out and say, that, Steve, that is so not true. You are in the place where God can best manifest, get best reveal his love to you, best show you his glory. Okay? Psalm 119.71, let's put it this way. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The affliction was worth it because through the affliction, I learned your statutes better, which mean I means I lived into them better, which means I don't fall short of the what? Glory of God. Paul puts it this way, and we have to understand. We, we, we take these verses, these verses, I'm, I'm going to read you like three or four verses, and we tend to take them, three, we tend to take them and view them separately like pearls on a string. But you've got to put them together. You've got to understand them at some level together. John, Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30. He says this, first, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So God, everything, everything works out for the good. Now, Everything works out for the good, and we've been called according to his purpose. Those two things are parallel. Good and purpose. God's purpose is good. Now, what is God's purpose for me? What is God's purpose for Steve? What is God's purpose for you? What's God's purpose for you in your life? Well, he, he answers it immediately. 
Okay? We know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God's purpose for you is to make you like Jesus. Okay? So all things are working together for the good. Good is what? B becoming more like Jesus. Everything that happens in your life is there so that you can become more like Jesus. More into the image of God, right? Because we are created in the image of God. So we are growing into the image. Then it says, for God, those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And then keep going. And those he predestined, he also called. Now it's going to freak you out in just a second. And those he called, he also justified. So there's a path going on here. We're predestined, we're called, we're justified, we become followers of Christ. And those he justified, he also, what's, what's the last word there? He also, what? Glorified. What? Yeah. God's calling purpose on your life is not just to glorify himself, but some mind-blowing way to glorify you and me. What? I'm, 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 what? I'm, okay, we've been talking God is so holy and so other and so spectacular and my job is to glorify him and now you're saying that somehow in this, in this thing it results in me being glorified? What the? What's going on? Well, here's the other place this can help us. Because if you're like me, you're probably not, but you might be like me. There's an awful lot of, there was a long period of my life when I really wasn't excited about going to heaven. I'll be honest with you. I didn't want to go to heaven. Why? It looked boring. No, it, worse than boring. Matter of fact, the picture of heaven is what? There's this picture that used to be around. I don't see it as much anymore. This idea of us riding on clouds playing harps. I'm going, A, boring, B, afraid of heights, C, not real crazy about heart music. That's a big O for three, right? That's three strikes you're out. I don't want to do that. And then comes the idea, the other picture that we get is heaven is us sitting around glorifying God, us worshiping God. You're going to worship God forever. I hear people say that. That's all you're going to do the whole time you're in heaven is you're going to worship God forever, which doesn't match up at all with what the Bible says. We're, there's nothing in the Bible that even hints we're going to spend eternity standing around God, worshiping him. Matter of fact, I just finished a study in Revelation. If you want to go catch up with it, you can get the podcast or watch the videos at stuffstevesays.com. But one of the things it has, there are certain angels, and these angels' jobs is to, to stay continuous in God's presence just singing praises. We worship him other ways. Matter of fact, he talks about commerce going on, about the gates of the city, the eternal city being open and closed, people going in and out and conducting business. It's back, it's a, it's a good world. It's a world that's no longer fallen and cursed. But read it, it's the end of Revelation. It does not describe us as human race spending eternity just standing around God singing. Well, what's going on? Okay. Well, let's, let's, let's stop and think about it for a second. What are we? What is the defining characteristic of humans? Now, some of you said, oh, we're fallen creatures. Not wrong answer. We are fallen creatures. But remember, we've got the two things going on in us. We are fallen creatures who were made in the image of God. Okay, The image of God, fallen creatures, image of God. Those are the two things that define us. Nothing I've ever seen defines humanity, helps understand humanity better than that. We are fallen creatures who are made in the image of God. But which one came first? Which is most, which is more integral to who I am as a person? The image of God. But number one, the fall came after. And number two, the curse will be removed. So the image of God in me is the most defining, it is the most important, it is the biggest definer of me is that I am created in the image of God. So, well, I'll tell you what, want to let Paul talk about this? Because um, 1 Corinthians eleven seven 7 says we are the image and glory of God. And Paul in Romans said that we will be glorified. Let's, let's, go, let's let Paul talk about that some more in, Roman, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
He's t- and he's talking about that event where Moses kept going back into the tent and, and, and had a radiance in his face because he was somewhat glorified. He says, we are not like Moses, this is 2 Corinthians 3 verse 13, we are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade away. So he's got a glory that's going to fade because he, he can't maintain it, okay? Then we go to verse 15. But even today, it says, when they, the Jewish people, read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, okay, whenever someone turns, how do you turn to the Lord? That's called repentance, that's called in our, that's taking a blue bag, that's accepting Christ. Whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now listen to this. So all of us who have had that veil removed, all of us who have accepted Jesus Christ, can see and reflect the glory of God. So we get to see and reflect the glory of God. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Now let me, here's English ESV has it this way, which catch that last phrase better. We all with unveiled faces beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same age, the same image from one degree of glory to another. We are step by step by step being transformed to be like God in his glory. And we are being glorified. Which means in eternity what's going on is not I'm standing around singing all the time or I'm not playing a harp all the time. Whatever the activities are, they are intended to help me grow more like Jesus so I am being glorified. I am becoming eternally more and more like Jesus. So God's glory to me makes eternity exciting. God's glory makes eternity exciting. It's not some boring time. It's not some weird time. It's not me going against who I am. It's me growing into the person I was created to be, that I was destined to be from the foundation of the world. It is me becoming everything God wants me to be in a way that I can never do here. And I'm going to spend my life here. Because he, he, the way he says it, it, says it, it's happening now that I am being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. But that's just continuing after we die, after we get to uh, heaven comes here. We don't go to heaven. Heaven comes to earth. After the new heaven and the new earth are created, we will spend eternity just continuously. Because God is infinitely amazing, we can never get to be just like him. But we'll spend eternity becoming better and better and more and more like him as we live into his glory. Now, are you tired of minimizing his glory in your life? Are you tired of living in such a way that you're saying, well, I don't mind falling short of the glory of God there. I don't want to live into those commands. I don't like those. I don't want to live into the glory of God there. I'm going to fall short of the glory of God any of the do commands or the don't commands or any area of my life, maybe one specific command God's placed in your life, you know you're supposed to do and you say, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to bring, let's get, say, it, say it honest, let's say it flat out, I don't want to do that or I want to not do that because I don't want to bring glory to God in that way, in that area. And I don't want God to glorify me and make me more like him in that area. That's the glory of God. That's what we are called to. That's what we call others to. We are not called to be rule followers. We are called to be God glorifiers as God glorifies us and transforms us into his image from one step of glory to the next, one step to the next step, to the next step, to the next step, of, from glory to glory. That's what, if you're a follower of Christ, that is God's call on your life, is to glorify God by being glorified. To show forth the holiness of God by being made holy. The distinctness of God, the love of God, whatever characteristic of God you want to put in there, faithfulness of God. We glorify God by acknowledging how his faithfulness is insanely better than ours. So much, even more than a Bugatti is better than an AMC Concord. We live into his glory. We promote his glory. And in turn, he glorifies us. 
That's why this word matters. And that's why if we're talking to somebody who's not a follower of Christ, we want them to understand and get it because as God is glorified, we are transformed into his likeness. We are glorified as well. Not exactly in the same way, but in some way. And that's what 21 days of prayer is about. It is about you working to glorify God as you are transformed more and more into the image of God as you commune with Him in prayer, as you bring your needs before Him in prayer. So make sure you get that booklet. Make sure you, and I know it would be easier if we were, if you were live today like we were last year at this time, we could just hand you a physical copy, but you can do it, download a PDF, and you can, or you can go to the, the cafe and you can pick it up. You can do this. It's a little thing. And three weeks from now, you'll be a better Christian. You'll be glorifying God even better than you are right now. And if you don't have that relationship with Christ, that's what we do blue bags for. That's the point. Okay? And if you don't have a relationship with Christ, then what, what I would ask you to do is, if you can, you're one, one of the groups setting kind of online watching with other people, let, us, let them know there's somebody there who'd probably love to talk to you about it. If you're watching later, you can do one of two things, or if you, if you just don't, don't want to call attention to yourself right now, how are you going to do that? You can either email me, steve at spoutsprings.org, or you can follow this link. Just type it in exactly. It's a weird link, but it works, okay? It'll take you right to our online blue bag, and you can, and, and if you want to do this, do this. We had somebody do this this week. I had got an email from somebody saying, hey, could you physically mail us a blue bag? And we said, you betcha, because we're all about the blue bags. We're all about people coming to know and grow into all God wanted to be. Okay, so if you want a blue bag, but if you, you need to have that relationship with Christ so that we can start, how did he say that before? Those, those he, what? Those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to his son. And those he predestined, he also called. And those who called, he also justified. Justification is the act whereby God forgives your sins and begins the process of really changing you. And that happens when you accept Christ. So if you want to be justified, if you want to start the process, let us know however, and we'll help you come to that relationship with Christ so God can begin the, the, the serious work of changing you in, in the image of, into the image of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And after that, well, that's where the baptism comes in. Baptism is where we announce, wait a second, we're revealing something. Because baptism is where we announce it. Announcing is revealing. We're glorifying God by being baptized. If you've never glorified God by being baptized and you're a follower of Christ, it's time to do that. We'll work out a time and place where we can do it safely and securely. Don't worry. We can handle this. We've done it before. Okay? To announce that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? If you're going, hey, I like... I like what this church is about. I like this church family. How do I become a part of this church family? Well... We have what we call an orientation chat. And in an orientation chat, you'd sit down with me either live, online, or by phone, and we just talk about you. We talk about your story, how, how, your, your faith journey. We talk about the church and what the church is about, and we talk about how the two can work together, how we can work together, you can work together with the church to become the person God created you to be so you can do all the things he created you to do. And so then you can grow, and as you grow, you help us grow and continue God's kingdom work because we're working together, okay? So that's how that works. Just let me know. Just send an email to steve at spoutsprings.org. By the way, if you're going to be baptized, it's baptism at spoutsprings.org. But God calls us to glorify him because it's the greatest good. And then he, in turn, glorifies us as he transforms us into his image. And that is worth everything. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for me, if that's okay. Father, thank you that those you call, you want to glorify Help me to live into it. Help us all to live into it. Help us not to take excuses to, and to justify falling short of the glory of God. And Father, we pray for, want to stop and pray for our military, especially the ones that are far from home, either through deployment or long-term temporary duty or whatever it is. Lord, keep them safe, keep them pure, bring them home soon and safe. Be with their families that are here. Help them to grow into all that you want them to be. Comfort them in this time. And Father, help us to do everything we do, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do. Help us to do it all for the glory of God. Amen.
Who I am, who I am. 